Look at Daniel chapter 2 through chapter 4, being righteous in an unrighteous world. Or, how to be Christ-like when surrounded by idiots. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Uh, the text isn't a text that brings us great doctrine and theology and moral teaching. It's just the story of David moving from the exile to king of Judah to king of Israel. And in the process, we see a bunch of lousy people doing lousy things all around David. And my emphasis in the text is David overcomes all of this pettiness, uh, unrighteousness, sinfulness, uh, pridefulness, selfishness, and everything else. David demonstrates a man of great wisdom and integrity throughout the transition to that of king of Israel. But again, he's surrounded by, well, unrighteous people who are doing things purely for themselves and not for God. We will not read all three chapters. Uh, we will read one verse, chapter 3, verse 1. And there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew steadily stronger, but the house of Saul grew weaker continually. There is civil war between David's armies, Judah, and Abner's armies, who he made ish king, which is the other 11 tribes of Israel. The main characters here are Abner, Joab, ish and David. I want to look specifically at Abner first, uh, because Abner is, is the main reason we have a lot of what we have in the Civil War. Uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. But Abner, son of Ner, commander of Saul's army, had taken ish the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahananim. He made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, the Je over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, or even over all Israel. Abner goes and takes Saul's son, Ishbosheth, whose name means what? Do you remember? Man of shame. Again, these parents name their kids. Uh, you got to wonder, is that their real birth name or they grow into that name? We'll never know. Who is Abner? In 1 Samuel, Abner is Saul's cousin. In chapter 14, verse 50, it says that Saul's uncle, his son Abner, becomes Saul's general in Saul's army. So Abner is blessed by being related to the new king of Israel, Saul, and Saul makes Abner his general. That doesn't mean Abner was qualified or knew what he was doing. It means he's related to Saul, <laughs> who is king. And Saul takes his favorite cousin, Abner, and makes him general over his army. We know he's general because he's the same verse, chapter 14, verse 50. Uh, it says that Abner became commander of Saul's army. Abner was the general at the battle where Goliath challenged Israel in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says that Abner was there with Saul when Goliath came out and defied the armies of Israel and defied the God of Israel. And my question here is, why didn't Abner go out there and kill Goliath as the general of Saul's army? Why did Abner sit back to this Philistine humiliate the armies of Israel and the God of Israel? Try to be the God of Israel. Where was Abner? He was hiding out with Saul. He was nowhere to be found as far as on the battlefield. Again, Abner gains his position because he is family. Uh, to read all the texts about Abner leads us with a poor picture of Abner in 1 Samuel. He's afraid to confront Goliath, David. A young man, barely a young man, goes out and kills Goliath. Uh, Abner slept while David and his friend stayed in the camp in 1 Samuel 26 and took Abner's spear and took Abner's canteen. David calls out to Abner, Abner, why are you sleeping and not defending your king, the Lord's anointed? David calls Abner out flat out in that text. Calls him a coward. Calls him a failure. Because David could have killed Saul and didn't. So David labels Abner for what he is in 1 Samuel 26. The end of 1 Samuel, Abner is nowhere to be found when Saul, his army, and his sons all die in battle. Now that's the one that bothers me the most about Abner. Because Abner should have been right beside his king fighting to the death. Abner should have died before Saul died. 
The general should have died for the king died. Where's Abner? He's nowhere to be found on the battlefield. This leaves me with a picture in 1 Samuel Abner as a man who's a failure to his king. I think a coward. I think Abner ran when the battle got hot and heavy in Samuel, 1 Samuel 31. And the king died and the king's sons died and the army was destroyed. His army is destroyed. And Abner's nowhere to be found. All that we can figure is he ran and hid in the face of danger, in the face of death, in the face of battle. Abner in 2 Samuel. Abner, Abner becomes a kingmaker. We just read that in verses 8 through 9. Abner goes and takes Ishbosheth, the man of shame, and makes him king. Ishbosheth was not there at the last battle of Saul with his other three sons to fight with his dad. Why not? Is that man of shame because he's a coward? Don't know, but he wasn't there. He's the only remaining son of Saul. Abner finds him and makes him king over Gilead, the text says. Where's Gilead? Does anybody have any biblical idea of location? Probably not. You have Israel. You have the Jordan River. You have Gilead. When they came up out of Egypt and Moses brought them up, two tribes, half tribe Manasseh, settled the eastern side of the Jordan. And everybody else takes Israel, the western side of the Jordan. So Abner's over here as far away from David as he can get to make Ishbosheth king of Israel. Israel on the eastern side of the Jordan. So Abner not, isn't even in Israel proper, if you will, when he makes Ishbosheth king. Uh, he's kind of hedging his bets here and not pushing it too much. The text lists the three tribes and says all of Israel follow Ishbosheth. But the picture there is not willingly or not eagerly are they following Ishbosheth. Again, they're way off to the east away from all the action. Uh, Abner leads Israel's army against Judah verses 12 through 17. Now Abner the son of Ner went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon with the servants of Ishbosheth the son of Saul. And Joab the son of Zerai and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon and sat down, one on one side of the pool, and the other on the other side of the pool. Then Abner said to Joab, Now let the young men arise and hold a contest before us. And Joab said, Let them arise. So they arose and went over by count twelve for Benjamin, and Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. Each one of them seized the opponent by the head and thrust his sword in his opponent's side, and they so they fell down together. Therefore that place was called Helkata Hazarim, which is in Gibeon. That day the battle was very severe, and Abner and the men of Israel were beaten before the servants of David. And I point this out. It bothers me that both Abner and Joab both have very little respect for their men and the lies of their men. They make sport of the situation. In verse 14, let them compete before us. This is civil war. People are going to die. Brother against brother are going to fight and die. And Abner and Joab too make light of this and make sport of this. Make it into a game to watch men kill each other. Worse than WWE. <laughs> the original Coliseum. And this bothers me because Abner is supposed to be a leader and Abner wants to defend and protect Israel and protect lives. And Joab as well. And they don't do that. They make sport of it. They make light of the whole idea of civil war. And that once this sporting event takes place, they go to battle and Many of the people of Israel die at the hand of the servants of David. Uh, it's a very serious matter. They make fun of it, and they ignore it. And when you read about the battle, which is 18 and following, we read about Abner running away from the battle. <laughs> Again, Abner in battle is running. Uh, he does kill one of Joab's brothers while he's running. Uh, eventually calls out Joab, please stop the battle, which Joab does because many Israelites are dying. The next thing we see in Abner in chapter 2 Samuel is chapter 3, uh, verses 6 through 11. It came about while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David that Abner was making himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone into my father's concubine? Then Abner was very angry over the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog, a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I shall catch the house of Saul, your father, 
to his brothers and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David. And yet today you charge me with a guilt concerning the woman. May God do so to Abner, and more also, if as the Lord has sworn to David, I do not accomplish this for him, who transferred the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to establish the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. And he could no longer answer Abner a word, because he was afraid of him. The next thing we see of Abner in 2 Samuel is that Abner, Abner is really the man in charge here, not Ishbosheth. Uh, the concubine would have been Ishbosheth's property uh, to do with as he saw fit. For Abner to take her is, is a misjustice of law and is an arrogant thing to do. Show his respect to his king and really just by out saying, I'm in charge or not to King Ishbosheth. So he puts himself over the authority of the king. I don't think Abner ever intended to serve Ishbosheth. Uh, he was a means to personal gain. Uh, Abner put Ishbosheth where he was as a puppet king that allowed Abner to do what Abner wanted to do. When the battle over and Saul was dead, we read of Abner going to make Ishbosheth king. Ishbosheth is not a man of any character, integrity, value, if you will. He becomes Abner's puppet king, and Abner runs everything. Abner sees an opportunity for himself, personal gain, and that's what he runs into. That's what he pursues. When Ishbosheth calls him out, Abner may realize it can't last forever, so he says, forget you, I'll join with David. Now, David will be king. Abner may or may not be commander of his army, but Abner will live in peace and wealth and luxury until he dies because David will reward the man who brings all of Israel to submit to David as king of Israel. And that's not Abner's plan. Uh, Abner is not David's friend. When he comes to David to offer David all of Israel to be his, that's not a friendly move on Abner's part. And I think David needed to realize and did realize that Abner was not his friend. This was politics. David knows Abner failed his king. He told him so in 1 Samuel. Uh, David sees him betraying his king, Ishbosheth, as Abner comes to David. Uh, David probably realizes that Abner comes to him expecting favors. So why does David accept Abner's offer to make him king? And that is the question. David, the righteous man, being surrounded by unrighteous men, Abner being the one here. Why does David agree to work with him and accept the offer? And my, my answer, I think, is very simple. David will work with Abner to save lives. David realizes that Abner does this, civil war is over, and no more Israelites will die at the hand of other Israelites. David realizes that Israel itself is in disarray. The Philistines defeated the Israelite army with Saul and moved in and took over cities. David realizes we need to gather our forces together quickly and confront the Philistines to run them out of Israel. So David's motive is pure. His whole motive is not trying to use Abner or work with Abner. His motive is he must unite Israel, stop the civil war, stop killing Israelites, and move forward to reestablish the nation of Israel as it should be. Notice in the text, David does not promise Abner anything. Chapter 3, verse 12. And then Abner sent messengers to David in his place, saying, Whose is the land? Make your covenant with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you to bring all Israel over to you. He said, Good, I will make a covenant with you, but I demand one thing of you, that namely that you shall not see my face unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see me. So there sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Give me my wife, Michael, to whom I was betrothed for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Ishbosheth sent and took her, from her husband, from Patil, the son of Laish. But her husband went with her, weeping as he went, and followed her as far as Barum. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. So he returned. Then now Abner had consulted with the elders of Israel, saying, In times past you were seeking David to be king over you. Now then do it, for the Lord has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David I will save my people Israel from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke of the hearing of Benjamin. In the addition, Abner went to speak to the hearing of David. In Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and to the whole house of Benjamin. When Abner came, David offers him nothing in return for his allegiance. So David accepts Abner's offer to bring all Israel to him, which he does, 
but David accepted that thing from Abner. Now note what we just read. When Abner spoke to the people of Israel, what did he say? In times past, you wanted David to be your king. I think when Saul died, Israel would have eagerly pursued David as king. If Abner had not stepped in and brought Ishbosheth in as his puppet king and set him up as king. That's part of my point about Abner. He's all about Abner. He is the reason there's still the war. He's the reason Israel embraced David as king immediately after Saul's death. It's Abner who wants the puppet king so Abner can profit from it. So Abner can have what he wants of Saul's household and Saul's goods. And again, Abner's Saul's cousin. He probably thinks he has a right to all that. Maybe be a king. Who knows? So Abner's whole motivation is Abner. I think David realizes that. And David offers Abner nothing in return for his allegiance. So David, I think, sees through Abner's motives. The next person in our text is Joab. Uh, Joab is David's general. Uh, from the beginning of David's exile, we see Joab leading the army with David in the battle. Joab was from Bethlehem. Uh, chapter 2, verse 32. And they took Ashahel and buried him in his father's tomb, which was in Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men went all night until, they, until the day dawned in Hebron. Ashahel is, is Joab's brother, who Abner killed in battle. They buried him in Bethlehem, the father's tomb, meaning Joab is from Bethlehem. Now, at this point, it's totally my thinking. Maybe Joab grew up with David who's also from Bethlehem. They probably knew each other. Went to the same elementary school. Or Jewish school. Or whatever. Uh, they, they probably had contact before now. Uh, possibly David brought Joab on board because David knew Joab, knew what he could do, and trusted him. Obviously, David trusts Joab for some reason because Joab was David to David's death as his general. And I will tell you, Joab has caused me problems throughout my life reading about David. Because Joab never appears to be a godly man, a man who worships God, or has any respect for God whatsoever. Yet David keeps him in his court, in his palace, at his table, as his general. And part of that is David knows how to lead men, I assume. But you never see a godly Joab. In the end, Joab dies a miserable death for his unrighteousness. So Joab's always a problem for me, but maybe it's because David knew him from a young boy, a young man, and knew he could trust Joab. In reality, Joab is the most faithful, loyal person to David throughout his whole life. Joab lives, breathes, and dies for David, his king. So whatever we'll say about Joab, one thing definite on his positive side, he was over the top, extremely loyal to his king, to David. So maybe that's why David kept him, because of that loyalty and that trust. He knew Joab would do what he wanted to do as he saw fit, except for two things. One is uh, Joab kills Abner, <laughs> which David didn't let it happen, but Joab does that. But other than that, David is able to trust Joab throughout everything, except for the same time David, Joab kills Amasa, another general uh, from Absalom, later on in the text. Those two times, Joab goes against David's wishes. Joab's character, uh, again, with the troops in chapter 2, 12 through 17, he makes sport of the war with Abner. Uh, has some breakdown of loyalty with David when he kills Abner. Uh, other than that, though, he's very much loyal to David. So there's Joab. Again, he's not a righteous man. He's there with David. David must deal with that. Now, that's kind of the setting getting to David the righteous man in the middle of all this unrighteousness, surrounded by Arrogant, selfish men. How does David enter the situation and get through the situation? Chapter 2, verse 1. It came about that afterwards that David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to one of the cities of the Judah? And the Lord said to him, Go up. So David said, Where shall I go up? And he said, To Hebron. David is able to survive being surrounded by unrighteous people because he inquires of the Lord. Very first thing. And to me, that is key. David survives as king. David thrives as king. David is chosen by God to be the kingly line for all eternity through Jesus because David goes to God first. 
David always goes to God first. David always looks to God. David has that childlike faith as an adult man. He absolutely blindly trusts God, looks to God, leans on God, and follows God. That's his, the key to his success. So he is able to navigate this field of unrighteousness as a righteous man because of his relationship with God. And don't miss that. Wherever we are in life, whatever we're dealing with in life, we will be surrounded by unrighteous or ignorant or arrogant or prideful, whatever, people. We can survive that and thrive in that environment if Jesus is our foundation. If he's the one we go to first. And the fact is, we go to work tomorrow, what are we surrounded by? Is it really godly people? Maybe religious people. Is it righteous people? So many of us find ourselves surrounded by people that don't know who Jesus is. We can thrive and survive in that environment if Jesus is our foundation if we had that relationship with him. Second, David navigates this series of events by being a good politician. Well, that, that is true, but that's not his motivation. Now look what David does after he inquires of God. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 2, 4 through 7, David praises those who buried Saul. Then the men of Judah came, and there anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, saying, It was the men of Je Jabesh Gilead who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh Gilead and said to them, May you be blessed to the Lord because you've shown this kindness to Saul, your Lord, and have buried him. Now may the Lord show loving kindness and truth to you, and I also will show this goodness to you because you have done this thing. David's public praise of the men who rescued Saul and his son's bodies from being disgraced and humiliated and buried them is a wise move on his part. I believe it comes from his heart. Is it politically good to do that? Yes. Because it communicates to all of Israel, all of Saul's house and Saul's followers, his love for Saul and Jonathan, his respect for them, his desire to see them treated properly in death. It, it is truly good politically, but it, that's not his motivation. David's heart is being displayed here. And the people see that. They don't see him as being giving lip service, political gain, to say what he says. He means it. Second, David seeks peace with Israel through, or third, David seeks peace with Israel through Abner. Uh, again, David has one goal, stop the civil war, stop the killing with Israel, unite Israel so we can be where we're supposed to be in God's eyes. Is this a good political move for David's part to join in with Abner? Absolutely. Is that his motive? Well, you know, in this case it may be. It may be all politics because David wants to unite Israel. So if I have to make a deal with Abner and then send him on his way, well, fine. Again, David's goal, David's heart is we must unite God's people and stop killing God's people with God's people. So the third thing David does with Abner is a good political move. And it may have been all about politics. But again, the bottom line for David is we must stop killing our brothers in this civil war. And, and welcoming Abner stops that immediately. Fourth, David shows wisdom when he mourns Abner's death. Now, when he does this in chapter 3, beginning verse 31, it's a very visible and focal event. Then David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes and gird on sackcloth and lament before Abner. And the king David walked behind the bearer. Thus they buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. The king chanted a lament for Abner and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, your feet put in fetters. As one falls before the wicked, you have fallen. And all the people wept again over him. Then all the people came to persuade David to eat bread while it was still day. But David said, Foul saying, May God do so to me, and more also, if I taste bread or anything else before the sun goes down. Now all the people took note of it, and it pleased them. Just as everything the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it had not been the will of the king to put Abner, the son of Ner, to death. Again, is that a great political move on David's part? Sure it is. Is that his motive? No. I think David truly wanted to communicate his heart to all of Israel. 
It is not my desire for unrighteousness to take place for personal gain. For David to kill Abner would have been great gain for David because that's the, the general of Ishbosheth's army. And David's saying, look, that's not my motive. Was that my desire? Peace is my motive. Peace is my desire. His public display of grief over Abner, the people see it, they see it for what it genuinely is, and they praise David for it. This move helps bring all of Israel to David as king. So again, he shows great wisdom when surrounded by unrighteousness. Fifth, David punishes the murderers of Ishbosheth. Chapter 4, two men come to Ishbosheth and they kill him. They take his head and they run to David and say, We've killed your enemy. Reward us handsomely. And David says, You killed a man in cold blood. That's murder. Your reward is death. And he kills him righteously. Because David's a man of righteousness. They committed unrighteousness. And they died by their own admission of guilt. They killed Ishbosheth, the king of Israel. So David's move here to kill them, was that a good political move? Sure it was. For Israel, yeah. This, these people killed their king. And David gave them justice and killed them. Was that his motivation? I think maybe, but I think mostly David is concerned with what is right. And what is right is you commit a cold-blooded murder according to the law of God, you will die for that. And they died for that. Uh, David wasn't into playing politics, which these two guys were doing. Which what Abner was doing. Which what Joab was doing. They will do what was right and righteous. And so he would never survive the day as a politician. <laughs> you can't be righteous and be a politician, can you? Uh, it's hard, hard to see that. The sixth thing, David, or the sixth thing in this story is the world around David is evil. However, because David seeks God first, he's able to, able to rise above the evil, the unrighteousness, the stupidity that surrounds him. It's interesting to read all three chapters and try and look at David and see where he's at. He is not in the middle of the unrighteousness. He's not instigating evil or murder or death or, or trying to slyly pull something off to make himself gain and power and, and, and appraisal of the people around him. David simply, wisely pursues God and what is right. And the end result is all of Israel comes to David and they make him king of all of Israel. The point here is, our circumstances do not make us who we are. Jesus does. My point here is, we can be sitting right where David is, not as king to be, but as anybody. Surrounded by unrighteousness, and through our relationship with God, we can wisely navigate through the circumstances in such a way, people see our good works, as they did with David, and praise God for it. Which is what Jesus tells us to do in Matthew chapter 5. Let your good works shine before me in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your God, your Father in heaven. So the point in reading all these verses and all these three chapters is acknowledge our world is just like David's world. We're surrounded by unrighteousness. But if I lean on and rely on and trust my relationship with God, He will give me wisdom to navigate life in such a way that they see Jesus in my life and they glorify Him because of my actions. And that's the whole point. <laughs> David didn't know it. We probably didn't know it. But as he walked through these three chapters, he lives out what Jesus tells us to live out. Let your good work shine for him in such a way they see God the Father and come to Him. God is sovereign. Everything that happens in these three chapters, God allows to happen, maybe even navigated to happen. God is sovereign. And all of this he uses to accomplish his task in David. When Israel comes to David, they come to him humbly, joyfully to make him king because they see his wisdom, they see his righteousness, they see his fairness, they see his genuine concern for all Israelites, not just David and his family. God is sovereign. God put these events in motion. God only things that happen. So God could be glorified through his servant David. Well, church, God is sovereign. The events and circumstances in your life, he's in control of. And he allows them or puts them there so that he can be glorified through you and me and how we navigate life through Jesus. Does that make sense?
I think it's kind of cool how it all comes together. We can go through horrible times, but because of my relationship with Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, because I know my Father in Heaven, I walk through them wisely, righteously, because of Him. And the world's not going to miss that. They can't miss the fact of what God's doing in my life and in your life. Let's pray. And Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you, Father, for the lessons you teach us to the lives of others, like David and Adder and Joab and Ishbosheth. Thank you, Father, you can use their life events, their circumstances, to communicate to us your sovereignty and your desire to work through us for your honor and your glory so the world can know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Help us be that faithful servant, Father, submitting to you, to allowing you to work through us and shine through us to reach the lost world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.